Hello and welcome to a Puzzled Panda video. Here are 100 facts about Alice in Wonderland. Alice in Wonderland is a 1951 animated feature film produced by Walt Disney Productions. It is based on the Alice books by Lewis Carroll. It is Disney's 13th animated feature film. If you want to watch fact videos for the first 12 films, then watch my playlist, 100 Facts About Disney Films. Walt Disney was familiar with Lewis Carroll's Alice books, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass. He had read them as a schoolboy and always kept the stories in the back of his head. In 1923, Walt Disney was a 21-year-old aspiring filmmaker. He founded the laugh studio in Kansas City. Walt made a short called Alice in Wonderland, loosely based on the Alice books. However, faced with business problems, the laugh studios went bankrupt in July 1923. The film was never released to the general public. Walt Disney had just enough money for a one-way ticket to Hollywood. He used the film as a pilot episode to show to potential distributors. Winkler Pictures agreed to distribute the Alice comedies. This led to 57 films being made. Walt Disney directed and produced all 57 films in the series. The animation was also done by Walt Disney. When Walt Disney was thinking about making the first ever animated feature film, he considered making Alice in Wonderland, but he was put off because Paramount were making a live action film of Alice at the time. Instead, he decided to make Snow White, but he did not abandon the idea of the Alice stories. In 1936, he made the Mickey Mouse cartoon Through the Mirror. In this cartoon short, Mickey travels through his mirror and enters a topsy-turvy world where everything is alive. In 1938, after the enormous success of Snow White, Disney bought the film rights to Alice in Wonderland. He then hired storyboard artist and art director David Hall to develop the story and concept art for the film. A story reel was completed in 1939 but Walt Disney was not pleased. He felt that Hall's drawings were too grotesque and too dark, making them very difficult to animate. If you look at David Hall's storyboards, there are a lot of shots that wound up in the final movie 20 years later. Oh, let go! I'm looking for a white rabbit. World War II began, and this put development on shutdown. In the fall of 1945, shortly after the war ended, Disney revived the story work on Alice in Wonderland. The story was difficult as the book was very episodic. The book is also wacky and absurd. One of the reasons why the book was so successful in the first place. Walt felt that there was something in this story that he dearly loved, but he didn't know what to do with it. And he kind of looked to the animators and the story people to give him something. The Alice stories meant a lot to Walt Disney which is why he was so determined to get it right, but he couldn't find the right approach. That all changed because of concept artist Mary Blair. For those who don't know Mary Blair, Mary Blair was a concept artist and art director at the Disney Studios. A concept artist would provide tons of concept paintings and color palettes that would actually inform how the entire movie looked. Her paintings perfectly created the world that Alice could exist in. She created very bold graphics and used bright colours to create her art. She influenced this movie to a great deal, as she did with Peter Pan and Cinderella. Did you ever see such a beautiful dress? The early 50s were really the Mary Blair years in terms of art direction and colour. Mary Blair used lots of interesting perspectives to create images that could only work in animation. This is why animation was the perfect medium for Alice in Wonderland, as it wouldn't have been possible to make this film in the 1950s in live action. She did stuff that was kind of warped perspective and flattened and weird. I mean, this was really the tailor-made project for Mary Blair. Curiouser and curiouser. Walt Disney assigned three directors to the film. These were Clyde Geronimi, Wilfred Jackson and Hamilton Lusk. Disney took an interesting approach with this film. Because the story was very episodic, the directors all decided to work on different scenes in the film. Some people say this improved the film, as the directors were competing with each other to produce their best work. However, some people say this created a story that was even more disconnected and episodic than before. 
All of Disney's nine old men worked as supervising directors on this film. Disney's nine old men were a group of animators who developed the Disney style. You had an all-star cast of animators here on this movie. You had the greats. You had Milt Call. You had Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnston. You had Ward Kimball. And you had a lot of people alongside of them doing really, really good animation. By that time, the, the animation department was run by the nine old men, Walt Disney's key animators, who really did all the movies from the 50s through the 60s into the early 70s. Ollie Johnston became very talented at drawing females, so Walt Disney cast Ollie as the titular role, Alice. Human characters are difficult to animate, as we see humans every day, and instinctively we know if they're drawn wrong. Even if we can't put our finger on what's wrong, we know something isn't correct. This is why it's so much easier to believe cartoon talking animals, because it's not something that we see every day. Nothing made too much sense, sense for Alice in Alice in Wonderland. Every character she met had some strange attitude that she was in conflict with all the time. This is a scene of Alice that I did in the section where she's talking to the doorknob. And she's very exasperated here in this particular scene. But you can also see how confining the drawings are. They have to be so accurate, because everybody knows what a real girl looks like. Oh, no use. <laughs> I forgot to tell you. <laughs> I'm locked. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Frank Thomas was Ollie's best friend. They reviewed each other's animations and helped improve them by bouncing ideas off of each other. Frank Thomas animated the doorknob, which was perfect for these animators who collaborated so well with each other. Frank was a master at observation. He would sit on a bench outside the Disney Studios and observe different people's walks and how they interacted with each other. He was always on the lookout for the next idea for a character. This is how to excel as an animator, by having a keen eye on what people's body language says about their character. Frank was in a band called the Firehouse Five Plus Two, with another one of Disney's nine old men, Ward Kimball. Frank played piano in the band. It was during this time that he found his next idea for a character. It was very good uh, for observing, because you know the piano player is supposed to, is like the host. If you're playing a trombone, you know, you got something in your face and you can't really do anything. If you're playing clarinet, banjo is pretty good. Drummer's always too busy hitting things. But the piano player, he sits here and he smiles and he nods and he's looking around. And I'm looking for characters that I can use in, in the pictures. It was actually while I was playing in the band that I saw my model for the Queen of Hearts. She's sitting at a table over there and she was very autocratic. She figured she was the queen, but she was sloppy in her manners and sloppy the way she ate and uh, um, there was just something about it that was funny. Oh. Who are you talking to? Oh, uh, cat, your majesty. Cat? Where? There! Ward Kimball loved to create exaggerated animation. Walt Disney knew this and always gave Ward eccentric characters to animate. For Alice in Wonderland, Ward Kimball was given Tweedledum and Tweedledee to animate. Ward animated these characters as if they were water balloons and drew them bouncing into each other. This was timed perfectly to the music and sound effects. Milt Carl created the design for Alice. Carefully based on live action reference, his design had a simple elegance. Milt animated the scene in which Alice defends herself in the trial. She shows a range of emotions from anger to frustration to disbelief. John Lounsbury worked on the smoking caterpillar he animated the famous line where the character says, Who are you? I love how the smoke forms a letter to represent each word. Mark Davies was also cast to animate Alice after his incredible animation on Cinderella. Mark knew that the laughs would not come from Alice as the main comedy would come from the Queen of Hearts, but Mark knew how important it was to get the character right for the picture. Eric Larson was responsible for introducing Cinderella in the previous feature film. Again, Eric was asked to be the animator responsible for introducing Alice to the audience. We understand immediately how bored Alice is in her usual world and how she longs for adventure. From a technical aspect, the dress required many folds in order for the fabric to appear convincing. 
This is a difficult task in animation, but Eric had experience from animating the dress when Cinderella and Prince Charming were dancing. Wooly Riverman animated the sequence in which the White Rabbit tries to prevent Alice from destroying his home. The White Rabbit is animated extremely well in this scene, as he is shown as frantic, constantly checking his watch, afraid of being late. We never find out what for. Les Clark also worked on this scene, and animated Alice growing and becoming stuck within the house. Les Clark shows the discomfort and fear Alice has of being stuck in the house. Same as the previous film, live action was filmed to aid the animators. Catherine Beaumont was cast as Alice as both the voice and live action performer. Walt Disney personally cast Beaumont after seeing the film On an Island with You in which she had a small role. I was involved with every scene, not only with the voice part, but Walt wanted me to do the live action. And the live action is basically just for inspiration for the artists. Ed Wynn was cast as the Mad Hatter and he created one of the most memorable scenes and created some excellent reference for the animators. They brought in the old vaudevillian Ed Wynn to do the Mad Hatter and he just went to town and they recorded the sound with it as well, you know, and he just was classic ad-libbing, horsing around. This is the nuts birthday party. Birthday? Certain things would just end up happening that was not what was rehearsed. What are you talking about? Tea! Oh, I never thought of tea, of course! Tea! <laughs> and then we'd all end up laughing and just having a great time. Sugar, two spoons, just a, two spoons, thank you, yes. And then they brought Edwin back into the booth to record his lines clean. But they weren't as funny as the extemporized performance that he gave for the live action reference. Mustard, yes, but mustard! Don't let's be silly! So they went back to that, and what you hear on the actual soundtrack is what he put down in that live action reference take. Lemon, that's different. They knew they were never gonna get that performance again. Over 30 potential songs are written, and many of them were included in the film, some for only a few seconds. The greatest number of songs in any Disney film. <laughs> Alice in Wonderland premiered at Leicester Square Theatre in London on July 26, 1951. Walt Disney wanted to use the new medium of television to help advertise Alice in Wonderland. Disney spoke to the Coca-Cola company about sponsoring an hour-long Christmas broadcast. The program became One Hour in Wonderland, which was aired on NBC on Christmas Day 1950. At the same time, a 10-minute featurette about the making of the film Operation Wonderland was produced and screened in theatres and on television stations. Catherine, this is James Melton. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Melton? How are you, Miss Catherine? What are you uh, studying so hard there, Catherine? Some of Alice's Jabberwocky? No, worse than that, algebra. You know, I think they were both invented by the same person. I think they... Quiet! Except... Rehearsal! We're ready for you now, Catherine. Oh, uh, do excuse me, please. Oh. This is the uh, mad tea party scene. The film had a very lukewarm reception. The New York Times wrote, if you are high on Disney whimsy, and if you'll take a somewhat slow, uneven pace, you should find this picture entertaining. God, savage guys. Alice in Wonderland was met with great criticism from Lewis Carroll fans, who accused Disney of Americanizing a great work of English literature. During its initial run, the film grossed $2.4 million in domestic rentals. Because of the film's production budget of $3 million, the studio wrote off a $1 million loss. Following the film's reception, it was not given a re-release in theatres like many of the other early Disney films. Instead, Walt Disney aired it on television when he began airing the anthology series Disneyland on ABC. Alice in Wonderland was received a lot better this time round and became a classic. Quick side note, Disney, can we get Disneyland, the anthology series, on Disney Plus? Because I would love to go back and rewatch all of it. I don't know if it still exists, I don't know if it's been wiped off of videotapes, but if it's still around somewhere, if you have it in that vault, please bring it out. Beginning in 1971, the film was screened in several sold out venues at college campuses, becoming the most rented film in some cities. Then, in 1974, 
Disney gave Alice in Wonderland its first theatrical re-release. The company even promoted it as a film in tune with the psychedelic times. Wow, the 70s. What a time. <laughs> Alice in Wonderland was one of the first titles available for the rental market on VHS. In January 2000, Walt Disney Home Video launched the Gold Classic Collection with Alice in Wonderland re-released on VHS and DVD on July the 4th, 2000. A fully restored two-disc masterpiece edition was released on January 27th, 2004. The film was released in a Blu-ray and DVD set on February the 1st, 2011 to celebrate its 60th anniversary, featuring a new HD restoration of the movie and many bonus features. When Walt Disney was creating the first plans for Disneyland, he knew he wanted an Alice in Wonderland attraction. There were many designs created, but eventually Disney settled on a ride based on the Mad Hatter's Tea Party. Mad Tea Party is a spinning teacup ride that was an opening day attraction in Disneyland in 1955. The attraction is at five out of the six Disney theme parks. What's up Shanghai Disneyland? Mad Hatter's not good enough for you? Huh? Huh? Although you are getting a Zootopia land, which I'm really jealous about. All five versions of the attraction are located in Fantasyland, and all except the Tokyo version were opening day attractions at their respective parks. Disneyland contains a dark ride based on the film in addition to the teacups. For a long period, it was the only Disney film to have two attractions in a theme park. I guess now there's, there's lots, you know, Toy Story has lots of rides, you know, Avatar has lots of rides, and Star Wars has lots of rides, so it's not that unique anymore, but it was for a long time. On the dark ride, guests ride on a caterpillar styled vehicle and visit scenes from the movie. Disneyland Paris also contains a hedge maze called Alice's Curious Labyrinth. It is made up of two sections. The first one with some of Alice's adventures prior to meeting the Queen of Hearts and the second based on Alice's encounter with the Queen. When you reach the top of the castle, you get an excellent view of the park. Here's a photo for me. <laughs> Here's a photo of me for proof. <laughs> Look at that view. <laughs> At the parks, you can meet Alice, the Mad Hatter, the White Rabbit, the Queen of Hearts, Tweedledum, and Tweedledee, as they make regular appearances at the Disney theme parks. Merchandise is still available in the parks today, including plush toys, t-shirts, and dolls. In the video game Kingdom Hearts and Kingdom Hearts Chain of Memories, Wonderland is a playable world. Alice is also a major character in the overall plot of the first game, due to her role as one of the seven Princesses of Heart. Which still doesn't make sense because she's not a princess, but hey ho. Alice and several other characters from the film were featured in The House of Mouse. Catherine Beaumont reprises her role as Alice and returned for two episodes. The Queen of Hearts was one of the villains featured in Mickey's House of Villains. The Mad Hatter was also featured in Mickey's Magical Christmas, snowed in at House of Mouse. A live action remake was released in 2010, directed by Tim Burton. It grossed over $1 billion, that's billion with a B. This started a trend of making live action versions of the Disney classics. A sequel, Alice Through the Looking Glass, was released in 2016 and made 299 million. Hey guys, thanks for watching the video. I'm terrible at doing these outro videos, but <laughs> you know, if you liked it, you know, give it a like or a comment, you know, it helps. And subscribe if you haven't already and click the bell icon if you wanna come back for future videos. All the stuff like that that I'm supposed to say. And <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it, guys. I have a playlist, 100 facts about Disney films. So if you enjoyed this, go back and watch the other ones. It all helps. Thanks, guys. Stay safe. <laughs>